too many too many cooks in the kitchen. Uh, I hopefully they learn from that. Two hours in the books, two left to play. Jody Mack hanging with you here on 94 WIP. Uh, we've tried to balance it the first couple hours. Got some good baseball uh, conversation with my buddy Joe from Cranford there at the end of the hour. Hoops with uh, John Gonzalez talking Sixers. I've given you my thoughts on the Flyers. I haven't gotten a Flyer call yet, but we're always ready, willing, and able to talk about the Philadelphia Eagles. And yes, uh, since when last I was on here on WIP early last week, we got a chance to meet Nick Sirianni. How did he come across to you? Um, his press conference was on with Angelo in the morning show this morning here on WIP. Uh, Jeff Laurie gave you the way that the whole thing proceeded. Are you feeling better about your Eagles or worse about your Eagles? That's a question I'm putting out there to all of you. And those same questions I'm going to put to my next guest. He's been good. He's come on every single week for me during the year to talk birds. He covers them day in and day out for both Sports Illustrated and phillyvoice.com. John McMullen joins me here on 94 WIP. JM, how are you? Hey, Jody. How are you? Good. Um, and I heard you uh, ask a specific question during the Nick Sirianni press conference. So you're uh, getting your own thoughts for the column you're going to write thereafter. You're paying attention to everybody else, taking notes on yours. And then your question comes up. Did you like the way your question fit into the overall Zoom conference at the time? Because you don't have control of it. They call on you when they call on you. Did you like what the coach said to you? Yeah, I did. I, I, I thought, uh, and it's not because it was my question. I was later on in the process. So, you know, he got hammered, obviously, and rightfully so with Carson Wentz questions. I mean, you have to ask those questions, uh, even though he's not in a position to answer them. Uh, I mean, the organization hasn't made the decision, so he's in a difficult spot there. But I, I went with, with, uh, the coaching staff and the inexperience and, some of those guys and, and how he plans to go about it, because uh, I mean, I, I think that's my biggest concern. I'm not worried about uh, an introductory press conference, winning or losing it. Um, yeah, I was a little bit nervous. I mean, Doug Peterson, you can go back to 2016. Uh, people mocked him. It, it, you know, you'll be defined ultimately by how you coach the team and wins and losses. So, you know, people talk about first impressions, and it's true, but first impressions to the media or the fans, they don't matter because they're going to, as I said, judge in on wins and losses. Now, first impressions inside that locker room, that's a big deal. And, and, and we'll see how he handles that and how the players, um, accept him and his coaching staff. I mean, the latest hire, uh, Nick Rallis is line, um, uh, assistant linebackers coach in Minnesota. 27 years old, Jody. 27 years old. Same as Alex Singleton. Uh, and that's the youngest, but there's not a lot of, of wise old, you know, owls on this staff. If you think about Jim Schwartz, Dave Sipp, all this experience, Ken Flajol, now you're talking about a 29 year old special teams coordinator, a 37 year old first time defensive coordinator a 27-year-old linebacker's coach. Look, they all might be wonderkins, but, boy, I, I don't know. I'd, I'd like to have a sounding board, I would say that. Uh, agreed on, on that end. Um, this is just my observation, and you know better than me, and that's why i got to ask you. Uh, because of connections and guys they've worked with before and known and guys they work with who have worked with the people who are being hired and the like, I don't want to say it's all Nick Sirianni's staff, but it seems like his fingerprints are more all over it than anyone else, including Howie Roseman. Before we even break down the young guys that they're hiring, how surprised are you that they've given Nick Sirianni what seems to be this much power and say-so over the staff that's being put together? 
Well, it, it's a surprise only because of the last coach. Uh, ultimately, I always say if you're going to hire a coach, you should have enough confidence in them to let them pick their staff. So I, I don't think it's weird at all unless you add the context of the last coach who, oh, by the way, won the only Lombardi trophy in team history, and for some reason you didn't extend that respect to him. So I think that's the only reason when you add that context in that it comes across as a little bit strange. Um, Yeah, I I would say that about any coach. If you're going to hire them, you should let them uh, pick their staff. And for the most part, the Eagles have done that with Nick Sirianni. I applaud that. Um, my question is on the old guy. Why the heck didn't he get to do that? I, I, that I can't answer. Uh, nor uh, will Harry Rosen or Jeff Flory. We can ask, but I don't know that either one are going to provide and or even have an answer for you on that. Um, you mentioned Wonderkind. Is this guy the assistant coach whisperer? Do, do you think there is the possibility that – uh, yeah, we're going to go through growing pains, but, damn, when it comes together, this young staff with a year or two under their belt are all going to blossom into uh, guys who will be uh, highly sought of around the league. Um, just judging from afar on what they've accomplished, other than their age, uh, are you hearing good things about the guys that Sirianni have reached out and given jobs to? Well, I think you said the right thing, growing pains. I mean, yeah, they could all turn into to great coaches, but I think it's going to take a while. I mean, that's the thing about this group. Um, there isn't a lot uh, of uh, history to go on for obvious reasons. Um, there isn't a lot of accomplishments uh, because they haven't had that opportunity. So it's, it's a catch-22. You know, we talk about it. In in relation to the Rooney Rule and hiring minorities, I mean, if you don't give people an opportunity, you don't know if they can do it. You could say the same thing about youth, uh, and and all you can say is we'll see. I, I mean, that's the best you can do. Uh, the only one uh, who's had a little bit uh, of experience is the offensive coordinator, uh, and that's Shane Steichen. He's had a, a year and a, and a little more than a year because he was the interim coordinator. Uh, the year before with the Chargers. Other than that, yeah, first-time defensive coordinator, first-time special teams coordinator, your quarterback's coach. A lot of people looked at him as the most important hire because of Carson Wentz and and, and Jalen Hurts, his first pro job. I just talked about the linebacker's coach. He's uh, 27 years old. The special teams coordinator is the youngest coordinator in the NFL, the entire NFL at 29 years old. Um So, you know, it's hard to say, yeah, these guys are going to be great, but I I don't think you can close the book on it. What I I do think you can say, again, is what you said at the beginning there, there's going to be growing pains. There has to be. John McMullen from SI and uh, phillyboys.com, our guest here on 94 WIP. All right, on the offensive side of the ball, he is certainly considered an offense coach, former offense coordinator of Indianapolis, coming in uh, with the resume he has, but has added a passing game coordinator and a uh, new quarterback coach and an offensive coordinator. Who is going to be the guy who is going to be tightest with Carson Wentz? If you were to guess, they surely haven't told us. that They may refuse to tell us, and we might not find out even when the season starts and gets underway. Uh, I can get your little 15-minute peek at practice, but you might not be able to find out who's the guy whose main gig is to uh, guide and formulate with Carson Wentz. Uh, off what they have done so far in their resume says, who do you think that's going to fall to? Uh, it's going to fall to Brian, Brian Johnson, the, the quarterback's coach. I mean, that's the guy who's going to work with the quarterbacks on a daily basis. That's the guy who's going to run the, the quarterback meetings. That's the guy who's going to work on the mechanics, the fundamentals, the day-to-day stuff. So everybody's important when you talk about – passing game coordinator, the offensive coordinator, and obviously the head coach is going to call the plays. I mean, those guys are going to be uh, real important when it comes to game plan. But when you talk about working day-to-day and having that closest relationship, just as it was with 
uh, Press Taylor and just as it was with John Filippo, even though, um, you know, it was a different type of relationship, more of a tough love relationship with John, um, those are the guys you're going to be closest to, at least working the closest to. Uh, that's just the natural evolution of how practice is and how the day is broken up. Uh, one of the things, it, it coming off last season, I, I think it would be, and this is not only Carson if he's here, but Jalen Hurts and anybody else who they might bring in. I think they had too many voices last year, and I think it's got to be more centralized. But, you know, I think a lot of that was spawned by Jeffrey Lurie and Harry Roseman because they insisted on these new voices from outside the organization, the Rich Gangarellas, uh, and they brought Marty back, Marty Morningwig. Yep. Um, too many too many cooks in the kitchen. Uh, I Hopefully they learn from that. They had guys who had been around a long time last year on the staff as compared to all the newbies that are in this year. Um Give me your take today. Uh, I thought uh, the coach sounded much more relaxed, much more confident with Angelo than in the Zoom session he had been in previously. He leaned heavily on competition when asked about the quarterback and that, hey, I, I like competition at every position on my football team, my cornerbacks, my quarterback, my linebackers, my offensive lineman, which is a great coach and speak stance to take. You, you want everybody competing. It keeps your uh, substitutes and your backup guys on their toes. Makes a lot of sense, but it's certainly not uh, 22 of 22 in the National Football League that that's the case year in and year out uh, for your positional <laughs> no. guys on your yeah. team. Um, how do you think it played for Eagle fans, and how do you think it played for Carson Wentz that everything's an open competition on the Eagles, as the coach said today? Well, I, I think it plays great with fans. They like to hear competition, meritocracy. Everybody should be fighting. I'll, I'll let you in on a little secret. The better teams in the NFL, they don't have a lot of competition. <laughs> you don't want competition. You want stars. You want clearly defined stars. And the more you have, the better you are in this league. Nobody's competing with Fletcher Cox. Uh, nobody was competing with Carson Wentz, uh, you know, until he regressed to a, a historic degree. Um, and that happens all over the league. It's not just the Eagles. Uh, I mean, your good players are your good players, and they're starters, and nobody's competing. You're trying to get better. Uh, naturally, you're trying to make the team. That That part is kind of baked in. You're competing against people behind you, but – the Eagles don't want competition at the quarterback position. That's the last thing they want. They want a, a clearly defined number one, like everybody else, who's a star. That's the goal everybody wants. Everybody wants Patrick Mahomes. Is there competition in Kansas City? It's absurd. But, uh, you know, that is coach speak. And it's something I, I, I do think uh, fans tend to, to latch on to, and they think it's a good thing. It's but wink, wink, it's not really a good thing. I don't know if you've heard, but anything is possible. Yeah, no, never mind. He's not getting <laughs> in the game on Sunday. Um, Carson Wentz has not been heard from in months. When is he going to be heard from? Is he going to be heard from? How important is it that he's heard from tomorrow or next week or the week after? I'm catching a lot of flack on social media from guys defending him and going, how can you get on his case for just not saying anything? There's no team. There's no games. Leave him alone. But he is the $30 million quarterback on this team and hasn't been heard from in months. Is it not fair to question why we haven't heard from him? No, it, it, it's fair. I, I think in a lot of ways, uh, speaking up and, and clearly defining uh, the position could help him. I think his reputation um, has taken a hit, and, and by reputation I mean around the league, uh, if he does want out of Philadelphia, and I do think he wants out of Philadelphia, um, I think it would help to explain the situation, um, and, and vice versa. If he doesn't want out, I think it would really help. Um, but he's decided to go in the direction he's gone, and that's obviously his right. Uh, I, I, again, I don't think it's helped him all that much. 
Uh, and we'll see. I, I ultimately, yeah, he's going to have to speak. The, the question is, does he speak here as a part of this organization, or does he speak in a new city after he's traded? Uh, and ultimately, that's what this comes down to. The organization is trying to figure out how to how to move forward. That's why Nick Sirianni had such difficulty answering uh, the questions about the quarterback situation because he's like everybody else. He's got no idea. <laughs> They haven't, they haven't nailed this down yet. And, and a lot of it is centered on, you know, Carson's unhappiness and how do you work things out? Remember, Jody, he can ask for a trade, which he hasn't done officially, uh, but that doesn't mean the Eagles can trade him. Right. Uh, you, you have to add that into the equation as well because of the salary, the money. And remember, you have the Stafford Goff trade. So, that's two teams that were in the quarterback market that are no longer in the quarterback market. So as, as this thing continues to move on, there'll be less and less teams. There's already talk of San Francisco going after Kirk Cousins. You have the top four kids in the draft. And remember, you get those cost-effective rookie deals. All of a sudden, these potential landing spots can dry up very quickly. Understood. Um, we have talked about uh, Carson Wentz and when he does talk, when he, how it could be best played out and the like. Have the Eagles handled this well? Because they are still his employer. They're writing his 30-plus million dollar checks. Now, there's a whole bunch of ramifications tied to them, salary cap and the like, but it's kind of still boss-employee relationship and they're just letting Carson Wentz dictate all terms of engagement. Are they being smart about it? Are they being wimpy about it? Are they being dumb about it? Uh, in a lot of ways. I mean, you see what's going on in, in Houston as well with Deshaun Watson. I, I mean, technically, the, the Texans have all the leverage. Technically, the Eagles have all the leverage in these types of situations. Uh, but it is, I, I think a little bit of a different landscape in modern professional sports. I, I think, you know, uh, athletes themselves have, have been able to sort of weaponize social media uh, to force themselves out uh, of certain situations. I think Stefan Diggs getting out of Minnesota was a perfect example of that. Uh, went on Twitter and boom, he was traded like 12 hours later. Um, now quarterbacks are a little bit different. Um, and, uh, you know, Watson will be the true test, uh, to see if, if, if the Texans really, um, sort of bow to him. Then you start saying, woof, the pendulum is shifting. But in theory, I mean, the Eagles have all the leverage here. So, um, they'll just make a decision by the third day of the league year. Uh, and, and Carson will have to abide by that decision unless he decides to really, really force the issue. Now, to me, personality-wise, he's never seen like that type of guy. But we'll see. If he really wants out that badly, maybe that turns. And it, you see it one way, and I see it slightly differently, so I guess i got to ask you this question this way. What is going to change between now and the first week of the NFL's new year uh, Carson's not going to play any games. Are they going to zero down on tape that much more, which the coach apparently didn't have time to do before he actually had his first press conference? <laughs> um, w they should have all their ducks in their, in a row and have their opinions on Carson Wentz as to whether they are or aren't going to trade him. Are they just uh, letting themselves be guided by what the market says? I know it's impossible to overlook, but... Shouldn't they already have their opinion on whether Carson Wentz can or can't be their quarterback going for the future? They should or shouldn't trade him. Shouldn't they really know that by now? Yeah, I think they do. Uh, and ultimately, I think uh, the plan was to try to, you know, reboot it for one more year, try the reclamation project and, and try to rebuild them and try to get the confidence back and try to get things going in, in a positive direction. But I do think uh, they're also, um, and you have to, uh, to, to, you know, defend the Eagles a little bit. 
Uh, you have to have those backup plans, those contingency plans. Uh, and, yeah, I mean, they're going to see uh, if there's teams interested. They're going to see if there's value. Um, how we certainly going to ask Jeffrey Lurie, hey, are you going to sign off on that $33 million, uh, of dead money? Uh, all these questions have probably already been answered, uh, and it comes down yeah, see to... See, that one to me, and I'm sorry to interrupt, that has to have already been answered. Yeah, Either no That's question. kind of a real simple yay or nay that the owner absolutely has the right to have it asked of him, and he's got to go thumbs up and thumbs down. Either you can or you can't. Either you're the owner and you go, well, yeah, all right, I know it's not pleasant, but if you're telling me this is the best way for us to move on because Jeff sat up there and told us about winning championships and that's why they fired Doug Peterson because he was more worried about winning in 2021 and the Eagles were looking at the longer field. Um, yeah, so that, Jeff lori has got to be able point. to answer that question now, doesn't he? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, the question, that question's already been answered, and, and, and more of it has to come to, again, even if Jeffrey Lurie said yes, okay, you are you can do that. Uh, again, that doesn't mean the Eagles can trade them. <laughs> I mean, there's still all the hurdles uh, I mentioned before as far as availability, as far as other options. Remember, a lot of these teams might be in a position, these quarterback-hungry teams might be in the position to draft uh, Fields or Lance or a young quarterback who's cost-effective, as I said, for five years, they might prefer that route yeah. Oh, yeah. than going for a quarterback that makes a ton of money and is coming off a, a, a terrible season. So uh, even if Jeffrey Lurie said, yes, um, I'll eat the money, it doesn't mean you can trade him. Um, so all of these things are factored into it, and, and that's what the Eagles are, are going through. But, yeah, behind the scenes, Howie and, and Jeff have already made this decision. Now, the only thing that I think could change it is, again, if Carson goes over the top and goes in that type of situation and becomes such an issue that he forces his way out of the organization, that I think could change things. But, again, from a personality standpoint, I find it very hard to believe he would do that. I was going to say, I, I, even though I'm not happy with Carson Wentz right now, uh, I wasn't happy with the way he played, and I'm not happy with the way he's handled his business, I doubt highly he's going to go as full gore, full bore, guns blazing as a guy like Deshaun Watson has already. Um, when do you think the dominoes start to fall in this? Did the Goff and... Uh, the trade with the Lions and the Rams got for uh, Matthew Stafford. Does that, uh, you pointed out, it takes two potential teams out of the mix, but it also sets the evaluation of players and values in the league a little bit. Um, how do you think this is going to fit as far as the timeline goes with the Eagles doing something at quarterback? Well, you can get things done as the NFL is changing. And I think the bigger part of the Stafford deal is the fact that um, you can see that that change, that shift in thinking. Uh, it, you go back five years, and if you talk about an NBA-like trade or, or a baseball-like trade, just didn't exist in the NFL. Didn't exist. Now – you have some new people in power and they're willing to accept new ideas and they're willing to, you know, sort of do what NBA teams do and pay a premium to get rid of so-called toxic assets. Uh, and I think that's what you're seeing. So I think the bigger part of that trade isn't evaluation. Uh, it's willingness uh, for NFL teams to listen to these types of situations where, uh, you'll take on a big contract if you're you're given. Uh, you know, Brock Osweiler really started this. Yes. When Houston sent him to Cleveland, uh, and Cleveland essentially bought, I think it was a second round pick. Um, that was really the start of it, and it slowly is going in that direction. Now, you know, it's interesting. The Rams had the record for what we said, uh, dead money, twenty one point eight million, and they set a new precedent. So that helps, but it's $22.2 million. Now, you know with owners, Jody, you know you've been around sports a long time. That's how precedents go. They go up a little bit. 
21.8 to 22.2. Okay. Can you go from 22.2 to 33? That's a big, big, big leap. Jerry Seinfeld would call that a big matzo ball. <laughs> uh, the answer in my eyes is yes, and I think Jeff Lurie is willing to do it. But the things you've been pointing out, and I've been kind of saying the same thing, because I feel the call. You know, they can get a first-round pick for Wentz. No, they couldn't. Second-round pick. No, they couldn't. Third-round pick. No, I don't think so. I, at best, if the perfect trade lines up, they might be able to get a day three pick. I've said all along, if they reaches the point, what you've already described as Carson Wentz going ballistic and forcing their hand and it getting real ugly and they have to do whatever they have to to just make sure they get Carson Wentz out of town, yeah, the Eagles might have to put a pick into the deal. They yeah. might have to move Carson <laughs> Wentz and a pick of their own just to get it done. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. The NBA-like deal, you're adding something on top to get the other team to pick up the toxic asset. That's where we are. Yeah. And and it, I... it is It is amazing. And, you know, you talk about some costs in this league. It's not only money. It's also the draft picks. And this is what the Rams just went through. Remember what the Rams and the Eagles gave up to get Jared Goff and Carson Wentz in 2016. Astonishing. Uh, um um, draft picks and, and, and the ability to go up in that draft. Then you pay them those second contracts, $128 million. Um, it, it's tough to do. The Rams, now the difference also, Jody, the Rams think they're, uh, and I think right, rightfully so, they think their championship window is open. The Eagles' championship window is not open. No. And it's not going to be open. And here's – we'll wrap it up on this. And, John, thanks for uh, hanging around with, with me as long as you did. Which do you think is more affected this off season with the years that both Goff and Wentz had and the seasons they had? You correctly pointed out not only did both teams have to shell out plenty to get into positions to draft them one and two, but both teams made – which now looks like a mistake, uh, the mistake of extending their contract and buying them as franchise quarterbacks, which is going to have more repercussions going forward for the other teams in the league? Will teams be more afraid of doing contract number two with a guy who's flashed but hasn't flashed like Mahomes has and has already won a Super Bowl? Or the teams in this offseason might be a little skittish to give up multiple draft picks to get into the top five or six to get in position to draft a quarterback, uh, if uh, history tends to repeat itself, which do you think is more affected, like Dak Prescott waiting on his contract, or the teams in that three, four, five, maybe even six slot Eagles that might be willing to trade down if a team wants to trade up that the offers aren't as good as they used to be? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I mean, I've, I've thought for years that it would go to more of the, this sort of college-like atmosphere where you just rotate every four years. And, you know, there's this cliche in, in football about quarterbacks, trucks and trailers. You have trucks who carry the load, the Patrick Mahomes and trailers, um, who need to be carried. In other words, you need to have everything built up around them. The difficulty is, you know, teams have to be honest with themselves. And the vast majority of quarterbacks are trailers. <laughs> and in that case, your best way to win a Super Bowl is that young quarterback on a rookie deal who doesn't cost a lot of money and maybe hit on them in the second or third year. And you're able, because you have that extra money, to build up the back end of your roster, build up a championship-level roster. You saw it with Russell Wilson uh, most notably in, in recent years before he got his new deal, and then Seattle took sort of a nosedive. Um, I, I, th- I thought that was going to be the template, uh, but i got to tell you, it's, you, Dak Prescott might be the perfect example of this. Really good quarterback, but I don't think he's a superstar. But when you get a quarterback like that and you're Dallas, you say, well, we're not going to get anybody better, so you talk yourself in the – Paying him this exorbitant amount of money. Kirk Cousins is another example of that. He's a good quarterback, but 
uh, you know, he's not good enough to win with. Understood. Uh, So I I would go in the other direction, but teams are just scared to do it because they don't think they can find competent quarterbacks. Well, I would remind at least one member of the media who uh, I disagreed with, uh, yourself, uh, who said maybe picking Jalen Hurts last year wasn't the worst thing in the world because they're doing exactly what John McMullen's talking about, being ready to move on when the uh, necessity you know uh, rears its you ugly know, head. If I thought that was their plan, I would give them credit for it, but it wasn't their plan. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Their plan was this new age offense, we're gonna we're gonna have Taysom Hill. We're gonna do this. We're gonna do all these unique things. It wasn't about uh, uh, you know part of it was about a safety net for Carson Wentz from a health standpoint because right. they were very concerned about that. But trust me, this organization did not think Carson Wentz was going to be anything but a really good quarterback. Well, maybe Howie Roseman can sneak that one off to Jeff Skoberski so he can get that out there in Twitter. That actually <laughs> was what the Eagles were thinking when they took Jalen Hurts in the second round. John, good stuff, as always. Appreciate it whenever you come on to do Eagles with us. Thanks much, buddy. I'll talk to you again soon. All right. Thank you, Jody. John McMullen here with us on 94 WIP. Went a little long with John there, but we we're having such a good time breaking everything down. If anyone has buzzed and is on hold, I'll get to you immediately. Go to the phones next. Hop aboard, 855-215-592-9494. Get you on with Jody Mack here on 94 WIP. Don't have time to call? Shoot us a text. The 94 WIP text line. Powered by BetQL.